privilege to have Chaplain uh, Mike Allen with us this morning. That's hard for me to say. You hear people refer to him as Pastor Mike because he was our pastor for 10 years. So if you're new or visiting with us, then uh, you'll, you'll understand that reference. And um, it, it, we're, we're privileged to have him because he's a busy man. Uh, you'll, you'll see later on uh, he, he, uh, he's on the move uh, quite often. Not only does he serve uh, as a chaplain in the National Guard, uh, he's the director of Frontline Fellowship, which is, the, which is a mission agency that we work closely with, uh, that um, you're so familiar with the school there, TBBI in Timisoara, Romania, and we thank the Lord for that work, and you're going to hear more about that later on. Uh, also uh, teaches a uh, class at Appalachian Bible College uh, twice a week, and so uh, again, uh, very busy, and, and I thank the Lord for him. I always want to remind you, uh, you know, the, the impact that he's had in my life, him and his family, is... is uh, is eternal, and I just thank the Lord for it. And so, Mike, if you come and share from the Word this morning. We're not going to do that yet. That's going to be Sunday school. Sorry. Well, the reason I stay on the move is it's hard to hit a moving target. Amen? <laughs> Am I on? Is, do I have to do anything? You're good. Okay. okay. Well, take your Bibles, if you would, this morning, and uh, open to First Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. What I want to share with you today is really a, a study that I've been able to share with a, a group of men probably for about the, the past six months. And uh, one, of the, one of the, as a pastor you always say this is your favorite, but one of the men that I greatly admire in the Old Testament is King David. And you, you look at the life of David, and, and uh, the Scripture reveals, in, in every man's life in the Scripture, the Scripture reveals the reality of the humanity of that individual. We often forget, we, we think sometimes when we read about the Apostle Paul, or we, we read about Peter, or we read about various men in the, in the, in the Scripture used by God, we, we often look at and think that maybe sometimes they might be sort of supermen, um, that, that, you know, they were people who, who were, um, you know, just specially endowed with, with great power. And, and, I, and I, I, I say that with, with these quotes. I, I do understand that the apostles had, had certain gifts and certain powers to authenticate them, I believe, as, as apostles. But, but yet they were very real individuals. They, they, were, they were men of flesh and blood like we are men of flesh and blood. And, and when, you, when you look at how God uses those men, it, it ought to be an encouragement to our hearts to desire to, to be used by God in similar manners and in similar ways. When I, when I look at David, and, and every, anyone, if you mention David, you usually immediately people remember probably two main events. And, and it's sad that most of the time you mention someone, they, mention, they always remember, no matter what all they did, they... They remember where they messed up. And, and, and that's a shame. And, and David did sin. And, and, and that sin cost David tragically as he sinned with Bathsheba. And that's probably one thing that you remember about, about David the man. But another thing, if I would ask another thing that you would remember about David, you would mention, and I know immediately there would be a man that would come to your mind named Goliath. And most of us even know where he's from. Goliath of... Gath, uh -huh. and and so you know, you think you think of David, and you, you see him as as this giant killer, and and he, and he and he was a giant killer. But understand this: David really did not have any power of his own. The things that he accomplished, God gave him the strength and ability to do it. David's trust, and you, and you think about Goliath, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to, don't worry, we're in 1 Samuel 30, so we're not going back there, but, but when, you think about, when you think about David, and you think about his life, and you think about the way that, that he conquered Goliath, you know, Goliath was like 9'9", I mean, it varies as far as interpretations, as far as how tall he was, but, but he was a huge individual. And, and, and if you looked at the odds, I'm sure if there was odds being given on the game, or the, the battle, sorry, if there was odds being given on that battle that day, that the odds would have, would have heavily favored Goliath. And yet God, and I, I want to make sure you hear this, and yet God used 
David to take down the Philistine who defied the armies, not of David, not of Israel, but defied the armies of the living God. It was for God's glory. It was God's work. It was God's power in David that helped him, that strengthened him, that gave him the ability, that guided the stone to defeat Goliath that day. And it was at that point that they began to sing these songs. You know the song. I'm sure you've heard this song. If I start it out, you can finish it. You may not have the same rhythm that I have, Thank God for that. But, 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 but you know the song. Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his ten thousands. Now, there's only one problem with that song. When you're king, you do not like any competition. You, in fact, any competition you usually eliminate. They did that back then. It kept from people taking the throne that you didn't want to have the throne. You just eliminated them. And as the ladies begin to sing the song about David killing his 10,000 as opposed to Saul killing his thousands, it caused David to, to, to make a shift in his thinking. And as, as, we, as we see his thinking deteriorate from trusting to fearing. David took some steps which, which, which led him to a point in our passage today. And, and again, this, this is all just introduction to get us to this passage. But let's look together, if, if you would, at 1 Samuel chapter 30. And I think just for sake of time this morning, I'm just going to read the first six verses. Uh, maybe we'll go into it more in the, in the, uh, the afternoon session. 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse 1. It says, now when David and his men came to Ziglag, please note this place. Note this place, because I, I say that to say this. I believe that probably every one of us here today, and I'm not being judgmental, I don't know your heart, I, I, I don't know what you've been through, I'm telling you what I'm preaching, I've experienced. I venture to guess that everybody here today, at one time or another, has had a zigzag. And if you haven't, you will. I'll continue reading. Now David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day. The Amalekites had made a raid against Nagab, and against Ziglag. And they had overcome Ziglag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. And they killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burnt, burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreel, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. Because all the people were bitter in soul, each for their sons and daughters. And notice this last sentence. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, I thank you for our time here this morning. And Lord, I pray that nothing here done this morning would be done in the power of the flesh or in the power of man, but Lord, may your spirit speak to our hearts through your living word. We thank you that it is powerful, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I pray that 
each of us would search our hearts today and see. Maybe even today we might find ourselves in a place like Ziglag. Lord, help us to understand that you alone are the one that we should trust in. You are our strength. You are our guide. Father, I pray that in our lives and in the situations, Father, that you give us each day that we will walk by faith, not by fear. Lord, we will walk in faith in what you would have us to do, not in fantasy as of what we desire to do. And Lord, may we trust you to lead and guide and direct our paths. Father, you order the steps of a good man. And Father, we thank you for that. And your word reminds us that even though we fall or stumble, we shall not be cast down for you, the Lord, upholdeth them with his hand. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I just ask that you just would Move in a special way in the hearts of your people today. And we'll give you the glory and praise for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As I read in the text, we see that Ziglag was an area that had just been destroyed by the Amalekites. And if you remember, the Amalekites were a constant thorn in the flesh to Israel. Um, if you remember... And again, I don't have time to go back in the context. Hope you're familiar with 1 Samuel. But one of the reasons, or the main reason, why Saul was not going to be king continually in Israel was because of his failure to wipe out the Amalekites. They were, they were a familiar enemy to Israel. And David, as his men come back from being with the Philistines, come back to Ziglag. Ziglag was the city that was the base of David's operations. And as you think about that, being part associated with the Philistines, being offici officially uh, uh, recognized as part of the territory, you may think, what was David doing in the first place in Ziglag? Why was he there? Well, the, the scripture gives us, we, we don't have great... Um, indications, but the scripture gives us some evidence of why David ended up going to Ziglag. If you would, follow me back, and, 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 and I hope you got your scriptures. Follow back to 1 Samuel chapter 21. I just want to go back, just a, a few passages here. 1 Samuel chapter 21. This is after David had destroyed or, or killed Goliath. This is after David has already been anointed to be king of Israel. And notice what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Look with me in verse 10. And David arose and fled for fear of who? Of Saul. Of Saul. Now wait. Had not God delivered David from the hands of Saul? Already? Several times? If, if you're familiar, you know that Saul has thrown a javelin a couple times at David. And each time, <clears throat> God delivered David. We know that God gave David, Jonathan, as a special friend. I would think of it as internal in intelligence. But yeah, they had a special friendship. And that God used Jonathan to, to help David. And yet it says here that David fled for fear of Saul. And notice where he goes. <laughs> and went to Achish, the king of where? Gath. Anyone remember where Goliath was from? Hopefully you're not, you're not that much asleep yet. Gath. David flees to Gath. What drove him there? Friends, let's not be too hard on him. I submit to you what drove him there was his fear. And we're going to see that as we...
progress through here. And, and notice verse 11. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing? Here's a song. Did they not sing one to another of him in dances? They weren't Baptists. They danced. Saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his what? Ten thousands? And, and notice what the scripture says. And David laid up these words, and, and this is a, a unique phrase, and, and it, it doesn't matter uh, what your translation says. Study this phrase no matter what, because you'll, you'll see something interesting about it. And David laid up these words in his heart and was very much afraid. I submit to you, beloved, according to Jeremiah 17, 9, that our heart is deceitfully wicked. And our heart can lead us and cause us to do things that may not necessarily be God's plan or definitely is not God's plan for our lives. He became greatly afraid. And notice what he does. Verse 13. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you any illustrations this morning. Verse 13. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gates and let his spittle Here's what I'm not going to illustrate. Let his spittle, his spit, fall upon his beard. Then Achish said unto his servants, Lo, ye see this man is mad? Why then have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? You know what David did? He acted. He played a part. He masqueraded. You know, we can almost parallel that to a New Testament term of hypocrite. He played a part that really wasn't him. And I submit to you as... Think about this for a moment. As David began to fear, rather than trusting God, the same God that delivered him from Saul twice, the same God that helped him defeat Goliath, as David began to fear, he began to act like someone he really wasn't. And friends, again, I don't know your heart today, but I know mine, and I don't trust it. But I can tell you, there have been times in my life where I acted other than what I really was because of fear. Fear of what people might think. Fear of what people might say. Fear of what people might do. We see this, I see this a lot in the world that I deal with in today. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I believe there are times that are people, are, people truly get sick. But I also believe that there are times where people act differently than what they really are to try to control the situation. And, and the thing is, as David played out this role, Achish believed him. Why is this crazy man in my house? I don't need him here. And we know that David departed there and went to the caves and, and, and hid. And, and even in those experiences, there were many times <clears throat> that, that God showed his protection on David's life. Many times. In fact, there were a couple times where, and I, we won't go into the text in detail here, but there were many times where David could have really reached out and touched him. Not that he would have wanted to where he was at, but he could have. There are many times David could have physically 
remove Saul. But he knew that wasn't God's plan. God protected David over and over and over again. Follow me, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 27. And I promise you, we will get back to our text. 1 Samuel chapter 27, just for a moment. You see this phrase again that, that, I, that I talked about here. 1 Samuel chapter 27, look at verse 1. And David said in his heart, I shall now one day perish by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should quickly escape into the land. Where's he going again? The Philistines. And you say, well, why would he go to the lands of Philistines? Well, at least he knew Saul was going to fall in there. You know, they, they were enemies. He said, I need to escape into the hand of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair me to seek me any, any more in any of the borders of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. And David arose and passed, he passed over with his, and not just David, who did he take with him? 600 men. Now, these were not your typical men that you would take with you. <laughs> In fact, I wish I had all, all day to, to, to do this, but, but these men, these men were men who were discouraged. These are men who were men who were depressed. They were, they were in debt. They, the, these men were not people that you might want to uh, make up your local church. How's that? But they were the men that God gave David for this time. And, and, and so when David flees, understand this. When David flees, he's just not fleeing by himself. He's taking these 600 men with him. And it's a good reminder. It's a good reminder for us today that oftentimes when we make decisions out of fear, it affects other people more than just us. David flees. The 600 men go with him. He takes them unto Achish, the king of Gath. And David dwelled in Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives. So we see that David goes, he, he leaves, he flees to Gath. And while he's there, his families, everybody is gathered there in Ziglag. It was, as I said, in our context of our verse today, it was the, the base of operations. David and his men went into the land of the Philistines from Ziglag. And while they were there, the Amalekites attack. And they come back. And this is where we're at. I promise you, I won't, know, I won't wander any further. We'll, we'll stay it. That was all introduction. How's that? 25 minutes introduction. <clears throat> they come back, and the city is burnt. Everything, as far as they know, is gone. Is gone. And again, my, my hyperactivity mind here takes over here some, but, but I, I can't imagine them coming over the hillside and seeing the fire. Seeing the smoke as it goes up. Looking at the city and seeing everything, everything destroyed and gone. What would you do? What would you just just entertain me a little bit here? What would you do if you went home today? And your home's gone. And you turn around and oh, your family's gone. They're gone. 
Maybe someone took them or, you know, just, just think about it for a minute. What would you do? How would you react? It definitely had an impact on David and his men. Notice, as I read before, notice with me. It, it says in verse, verse 4, Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept. Now notice, wept until they had no more power to weep. Think they're hurting? They cry to the point of where they had nothing left. Remember, they've just traveled. This trip from, the, from Philistines back to Ziglag, the land of Philistines where they were at back to Ziglag, was probably about 60 miles. And they've just traveled there, and they've just come home. <clears throat> Everything's gone. They're exhausted. They're tired. And now everything's destroyed. Everything's gone. Verse 6, and David was greatly distressed. And listen to this. For the people spoke of stoning him. <laughs> Who's getting the blame now? David is. David is. They want to kill him. Their family's gone, their possessions gone, their children, their sons, their daughters, everything's gone. And David was one that drug them away. Why was David, why were they there to begin with? I believe they were there to begin with because David was afraid of Saul. And David let his fear drive him to the point of where he ran and drugged the 600 men with him. And now he's reaping. The people are gone. The men that are with him want to kill him. What would you do? What would you do? I know what I've done before. What would you do? Notice what David does. But David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. Where did David go for strength? He didn't go to the neighbor next door. He didn't go to the church. He didn't go to the preacher. He didn't go to a lot of different resources we go to. He went to his God. Because it was God who defended him. It was God who led him. And, and, and beloved, I, I hope you see this today. Because many times, many times, we are driven by fears and not faith. Our trust is in God. And it, it, it's like he does a 180 degrees. Notice what he does here. I haven't read this yet, but look at verse 7. And David said to Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring here the ephod. Now, you've got, you got to understand we're in a different dispensation here. You know, you know in order to find the, the will of God, the priest, we don't have priests today, you know, but, but the priest 
would, would carry the ephod. And the ephod was a, was a way in which that they would determine what the will of God was. They had the urim, the thurm, the dice, or whatever they were, the stones that went around the shoulders of the priests. And, and with that, they would determine what it was God's will. And David, notice what, he's, what he does here. He, he had the priest come with the ephod, and, Abba, and, and, and Abathar brought there the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord. And notice this. He's not asking just general statements. He's asking specifics at this point now. He says, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? Two questions, not one, two questions. Shall I pursue? <laughs> and shall I, shall I take them? Let me tell you what, David is back into the, to the, the place of where he wants God to direct everything that he's getting ready to do. And, and notice the Lord answers. The Lord answers and says, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover what? Oh, oh. You know what drove David at this point? Answered prayer. And not only this, don't, if, you, if you miss this part, you miss it all. Answered prayer and God's promises. You can do this and go after him, and you will recover all. And beloved, wow, because of the word of God that we have, isn't it wonderful that, that our faith, that our trust, that we, we, we don't have to waver, we can trust in the living word of God and in the promises of God, and that God will keep his promises. God will deliver. So he goes, and so notice verse 9, so David and his 600 men went with him, and they came to the brook, and I told myself I wouldn't do this. My kids, every time I preach, my kids say, Dad, never tell jokes, okay? I'm not telling a joke. It's here in the scripture, okay? So they came to the land of Besor, and I'm sorry, I, every time I, I see this, you, you'll read why as we, as, we, as we read it. Where those that were left behind stayed. But David and 400 men, for the 200 abode behind, who were so faint that they could not go over the brook of Besor. They couldn't go because they were sore, okay? They, they, they didn't make it. They were the old guys like me. Yeah, they... they, they they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't make it, okay? So, so, so they, they get to this point in, in, in rushing, and, and they get there. And, and 200 of the men stop. But it doesn't stop the rest. The rest of them pursue. They're, they're after them. And, and notice this. Verse 11. Or excuse me. Yeah, verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. And they made him drink water and they gave him a piece of cake of figs. And, and by the way, if you study those figs that they used, those figs had natural sugar. They were made like a power bar, that, that even like today as, as, you, as, you, as you see the things, with the two clusters of the raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drank any water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, who do you belong to? And he said, uh, and where are you from? And he, and, and he said, I am a, a man of e Egypt, a servant to an Amalekite. My master left me here because three days ago I fell sick. Who's he find? He finds a, a, a slave of an Amalekite who he just left there because he, he didn't want to take the time to take care of him. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? And, the, and here he goes, verse 14. And we made an invasion upon the south of Cherith, and upon the border which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag with fire. And David said to him, Can you bring me to this company? And he said, Swear to me by God that thou will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, that I will bring thee down to this company. You think it was accident? They're wandering they come upon the servant. <clears throat> Friends, I submit to you that God's hand is providential. 
as we walk through this life. There are, for a child of God, there are no, no accidents. David is pursuing. They find the Egyptian. The Egyptian tells them where they're at. And David and his 400 men conquer the Amalekites. They recover, just like God promised. They recover everything. Everything. And they come back to the land. And the 400, they want to say, hey, let's keep, let's keep all this. Let's keep all this. Let's not share it with the 200. Let's not share it with the beast source. They didn't go with us. And I'll, I want you to notice, because if, if you miss this, you miss what you see David seeing as God's taking care of him. God's provision. Notice verse 23 with me. Again, I, 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 can't, I don't have time to read it all, but we get to verse 23. Then David said, you shall not do so, my brethren. He, you're, you're not going to leave out the 200. You shall not do so, my brethren. Why? Why did David make this decision? With that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hands. Think David understood who gave him the victory? Think David understood at this point who it was that provided everything that he had, who protected him, who guided him, who, who, who took his life and used him David understood it was the Lord. It was the Lord. Beloved, I will tell you that there are going to be many times in your life that you are going to be driven by fear and not by faith. There are going to be many times in life where you might be driven by your worries rather than trusting in his word. There may be many times in life that you feel terrorized rather than trusting. But I submit to you that our God is still on the throne. And there are times when zigzags will come because we find ourselves driven by wrong ideas. I really believe that in David's fantasy, and I, I, I say that the word fantasy because I think sometimes we have fantasies about what we think we want to do for, for whatever purposes, that there were times where David really believed in his fantasy that if he just got to the land of the Philistines, everything would be great. I've dealt this when couples are struggling in marriage. They think, oh, we just moved to another place and everything will be fine. I've dealt with this as a pastor, as church members. If we just get to another church, everything will be fine. The only problem is you drag the problem with you. Because truth be known, and again, I know I'm not going to win any friends by saying this, the problem is with you because the problem is you. The problem is me. I am so thankful that I can be confident of this very thing. That he, God, who begun a good work in me, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
you can be confident of that. I know I'm running out of time. My wife bought a ba- bought a brought a bag of Fritos because she knew I was going to preach long. Real quickly, turn with me to Psalm 56. Let me let me just tie this all together. Turn with me to Psalm 56. It says, and, and, and again, I, these, these are not inspired notes, okay? But it, it says at the top of the psalm, of Psalm 56, it says to the choir master, according to the dove on the far off terebinths, it's, it's a silent dove, so to speak, a make of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. And, and again... <clears throat> I, I hope you understand that those are not inspired as much as the scriptures themselves are. But, and, and, and I acknowledge you that I am influenced by my study of the text that I share with you this morning. But read with me this chapter and picture it in line of, with what we read in David's life this morning. Be gracious to me. Some translations say mercy. In fact, this is the second psalm where David begins pleading with mercy. The first one, Psalm 51. But, but he, says, he says, Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples upon me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. You get the picture? This is going on day after day after day. And I'm sure there were some times in David's life where he thought it would just never end. But notice his declaration here. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God, whose word... Where's he going back to? God's promises, right? In God whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps. As they have waited for my life, for their crime will they escape. In wrath cast down the people of God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call, this I know, praise the Lord, that God is for me. Romans 8.31, right, beloved? If God be for us, who should be against us? What precious promises. God is for me. In God, whose word I I think he breaks out in praise here. In God's whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? We ought to be concerned about the glory of God. Not the fear of man. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thanks offering to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. And really, every one of us here that know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior can praise the Lord for that. Amen. He has delivered our soul from death. 
Yes, my feet, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. And that's what we should desire to do. Friend, today, maybe you're in a zigzag. I don't know. But I can tell you this. And what I'm telling you, believe me, I have to practice. May we live our lives by faith and not by fear. I go back to David and Goliath. I, I saw this quote a couple times this week. It's come to my mind. You know, some people, some people thought that Goliath was too big to kill. But David thought Goliath was too big to miss. You know why? Because God can't miss. He will perform. He will do that which he promises in his word. Let's pray.